Okay. Uh, we'll pick up where we left off. Um, hopefully maintain that level of energy we're trying to hold on to. And um, again, the same goal I have is very similar to what I did with the previous lecture, which is to do a lot of carrying for you. So that way, um, the questions that you have, uh, which I welcome, uh, get answered and locked in through the process that I'm uh, uh, using. Um, one of the things, one of my favorite subjects and one of my favorite uh, uh, procedures to do is centered around the thyroid. Um, I am an otolaryngologist who's done a head and neck fellowship uh, and has had a primarily head and neck oncology practice, which includes a very uh, large uh, thyroid parathyroid practice. Um, I am a son of a general surgeon who um, in his career, uh, the thyroid was owned by general surgeons. Uh, but uh, told me that things were changing. And now we've reached a point where both uh, uh, the, the reality of uh, successful thyroid surgery does center on endocrine fellowship trained uh, general surgeons or head and neck trained ENTs. And the cross-pollination has been fantastic. I've enjoyed my 30-year uh, career watching us stand across from the, each other from the aisle to collaborating at the highest level and have enjoyed my relationships. Uh, with uh, Angelos and Quaken here at University of Chicago and um, the other team members who are uh, part of the uh, thyroid cancer group. But this is a complicated subject. So my goal isn't to talk at that level, but to talk where you walk away with in this one hour, a synthesized version of what you need to know uh, for uh, uh, upcoming boards. There will be a practical component to this that could enhance your practice, there's no question. And it may actually indeed support your, um, your decision-making both in the operating room and leading to surgery. Uh, but in the end, everything I'm gonna do in this hour is going to invest in that ability to regurgitate knowledge in a multiple choice or an open um, oral board uh, approach. So let's start with um, some important facts that you need to have as part of your overall knowledge. Uh, we're gonna focus on well-differentiated thyroid cancer as our primary discussion. Uh, everything else gets a little bit more complicated and less test worthy, if I may. Uh, but uh, well differentiated thyroid cancer will include papillary, follicular, and medullary. Um, what I'm going to focus on initially with these three are the facts, the factoids, the pieces of regurgitatable information, if that's such a word, that you need to be able to just spit out on a multiple choice. You should know these. These should be automatic for you. Okay. So with papillary, um, and with, and by the way, What's important about this presentation is, is it is in the context of what's happened over my career, which is aggressive per surgery, de-escalating to less aggressive surgery, to escalating back to aggressive surgery, and more recently with the advent of molecular testing and more longitudinal data now supporting this, return to de-escalation of therapy. And so a lot of what the boards will board questions will do is We've been now in this de-escalation mode long enough to actually point to the standard of practice through the ATA guidelines and through the multiple discussions that have been uh, floating and presenting over the years to the point that this recent de-escalation is very worthy of uh, boards and board testing. So I'll make sure we cover that so that way there's no confusion about where we are with all of that right now. But here's some facts. We know that all well-differentiated thyroid cancers have an excellent prognosis, starting with papillary with the best. Um, one of the key things about um, papillary cancer is its pattern of spread um, to the group, uh, which is higher, lymph node metastasis or hematogenous metastasis when it comes to papillary cancer. Yes, lymph node. Does the presence of lymph node metastasis reduce survival? No, that is a very important fundamental understanding of this disease and is what has been a supportive part of our decision to de-escalate therapy. So in general, we recognize that the pattern of spread is lymph node uh, as much as 40% and hematogenous less than 10. Uh, one of the other things we need to recognize is what's the other pattern of behavior of pap papillary cancer? That it is multicentric, right? Multifocal disease. This is actually what has led to this fluctuation in aggressive versus less aggressive, aggressive versus less aggressive. And that is because of the concern that when you remove a 
incidental or a, a found nodule with papillary cancer on one side, that you must remove the rest of the thyroid gland because of this multifocal disease. Because the original uh, longstanding thinking is that recurrence in the non-operated uh, thyroid side was one of the key reasons for poor prognosis. Uh, and that by removing all of thyroid tissue in all of in papillary cancer in general, you were addressing this multifocality and therefore improving survival by doing so. And this multifocal disease I, um, uh, understanding is why total thyroidectomy was traditionally considered as the primary step in papillary cancer of all sizes and all differentiations. What we know now is that that is not true and we can deescalate therapy, but you at least need to know the, the premise for total thyroidectomy for papillary cancer. Histologic features include somoma bodies and what else? Anybody? Orphan anti-nuclei? Uh, What's the other name for orphan anti-nuclei? Orphan anti-eyes? Has anyone actually seen orphan anti, the reason for orphan anti-eyes, the uh, New York Times cartoon that was uh, a top cartoon in the newspapers for a long time? Does anyone even know what she looks like? So reason why it's called orphan anti-eyes is because it is an allusion to what is referred to as central nuclear clearing, right? Empty uh, vacuoles of, uh, of the nuclei. Very good, that is correct. So central nuclear clearing is seen here. Uh, you can see the pink staining somoma bodies. You see that, right? These are responsible in larger uh, form for the microcalcifications on radiographic studies and ultrasound, right? The somoma bodies. But the other thing that you need to recognize is this central nuclear clearing, right? There it is up close. There is the nuclei with the uh, sort of empty look uh, to uh, the central part. This is a pathognomonic for papillary cancer, particularly when you have the combination of some old bodies and the central nuclear clearing. Um, and uh, orphan anti-eyes is uh, the cartoon here. For those of you who don't know what the cartoon is, uh, this sort of creepy looking dog and character of orphan Annie who have no pupils. Uh, thus, orphan anti-eyes. Um, uh, it's amazing that they drew that the uh, uh, author drew the cartoons in this way, and, and it had its popularity. But it was such a distinct feature. Uh, just for those of you who've seen the Broadway play, the uh, uh, performers in Broadway do actually have pupils. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. That was just pretty spontaneous. Anyway, papillary fronds are the other things in cystic degeneration. Um, our other features, so the papillary fronds within a cyst are important. Remember what I said earlier about the differential for cystic neck mass includes what congenital cyst and branchial cleft and thyroglossal and cystic metastasis in terms of thyroid and squamous cell cancer of the tonsil, right? So this cystic metastasis, this cystic change is, a, is one of the things we will see not only in tumors in the thyroid, but in metastasis of the lymph node from papillary cancer. Let's jump to follicular. I'm just jumping to some of these histopathologic things you need to remember um, as a foundational uh, knowledge uh, for follicular. Again, another uh, excellent prognosis uh, in terms of a well-differentiated follicular adenocarcinoma. Uh, in this case, uh, what makes it different from papillary in terms of behavior is uh, which one is more likely to happen. It's going to be hematogenous metastasis. Um, and one of the things that this centers on is understanding what the histopathologic findings are in follicular uh, adenocarcinoma. Uh, one of the key things is the histologic features. I hope you know this already, but I want to make sure you have this locked in. This is so important. Uh, follicular adenoma versus follicular adenocarcinoma. Um, this is a histologic uh, low power uh, view of a specimen of a nodule that has, by definition, a follicular neoplastic presentation. But based on this, one cannot establish the diagnosis of whether this is a follicular adenoma versus a true follicular adenocarcinoma. How would we do that? Well, this is actually medium power. We would back up to a slightly lower power so that we could get a broader view and we would look at the capsule. What else will we look at? And the, that what we see here is that we see vascular structure, right? We see endothelial lining, right? You see it? Endothelial lining. And then you see what would have been a view here. Oops, hang on, hang on, hang in there. I'm getting it. Fascinating. 
I stopped advancing. Let's try this. Oh, look at that. You saw you were looking at that area there, but by only focusing on that area, you cannot tell what you should have been able to see here, there, which is that area there, which shows the same sort of uh, uh, neoplastic, uh, follicular neoplastic pattern, but this now isolates out the angio invasion, vascular invasion. And it is this picture that locks in in your understanding of follicular adenocarcinoma and why total thyroidectomy was so important as a consideration for follicular adenocarcinoma historically. And what is that? The fact that this angio invasion, which is going to, through its finding, establish a diagnosis of follicular adenocarcinoma, but also remind you that the incidence of hematogenous metastasis is higher based on this angio invasion type of pattern. And by doing so, how do you manage hematogenous metastasis. How does one manage that? Well, you would do it through radioactive iodine, right? RAI. But RAI is only as good as the minimal amount of tissue present. So if you want to kill metastatic follicular adenocarcinoma that's hematogenously spread, you need to make sure the radioactive iodine can go there and not get lost and sucked up by any residual thyroid tissue in the neck which is why a total thyroidectomy was critical in this concept, where in follicular adenocarcinoma, you needed to do a total thyroidectomy so that you had minimal thyroid tissue in the neck so that radioactive iodine, which is concentration dependent, is no longer sucking up in the neck, but now can concentrate in distant metastasis in uh, follicular adenocarcinoma. And that was the reason for total thyroidectomy. So now you have the concept uh, historically, of total thyroidectomy for papillary cancer, which was for multicentricity, and you have the concept for total thyroidectomy for follicular adenocarcinoma because of improvement of the rule of radioactive iodine and hematogenous metastasis. But without skipping too far to the punchline, we recognize that we're uh, de escalating the amount of cases that uh, require total thyroidectomies through molecular testing, and we will get to that point. Uh, so, capsular and vessel invasion um, will, will not be seen on FNA or frozen section, but will be seen on permanent section, which is why a diagnostic lobectomy of the nodule that is a follicular neoplasm was foundational in the uh, uh, next step to establishing whether you had an invasive pattern. And you can only do that by doing a diagnostic lobectomy, giving the nodule for full permanent section, deli slicing everything, and then studying for this angio invasion, okay? A little sidebar, Herthel cell variant of follicular neoplasm, Herthel cells are these uh, oncocytic uh, type uh, pattern with cellular enlargement and eosinophilic granular cytoplasm. You get a very distinct feature with this pattern of staining here. These are Herthel cells. Herthel cell uh, uh, predominance in a follicular adenocarcinoma, making it a Herthel cell adenocarcinoma is more aggressive than follicular adenocarcinoma. Herthel cell variant of follicular adenocarcinoma so has a higher incidence of local aggressiveness and hematogenous metastasis. So uh, establishing whether you have a Herthel cell uh, variant of follicular adenocarcinoma starts with a patient who has a nodule and on FNA has Herthel cells on the FNA, raising the possibility of this more aggressive version. Reality, Herthel cells on FNA are less commonly associated with follicular cancer of, of Herthel's, with Herthel cell variant. It is more commonly associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis or even a benign go goiter. So an FNA with, uh, yes, Herthel cells can spread lymphatically. They all, they all can, right? Uh, but Herthel cells can have a higher incidence of both the lymph node and hematogenous metastasis. But keep in mind, the point I'm making here is that Herthel cells Herthel cells by themselves does not say that you have cancer. You still need to take extra steps to figure out what's going on. And one of those to consider is the fact that Herthel cells on FNA, while a potential specter of the aggressive follicular variant, or I'm sorry, Herthel cell variant of follicular cancer, the reality is it's most commonly associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And one can establish Hashimoto's thyroiditis diagnosis uh, through uh, uh, serologic testing. What is that test? Anti- anti should be